impact um, program um, for the Modern Languages faculty. So every now and then she feels uh, um, compelled to do these fanfares. So you'll just have to live with that. <laughs> Great. Okay. Let's just. Um, I'm just going to pour some water for us. I'll pull the water. Okay. You stop. Okay. I'll stop. Well. Um, <clears throat> from a wonderfully entertaining, suggestive, and evocative session about birds and sound and nonsense to uh, the, the, the dread agenda of impact that is, that is associated with, with um, all funded projects nowadays. And what we thought we might do with this session with uh, Rebecca Braun and with Catherine Cole herself, the PI on the project, is, is think aloud a bit about what assessing impact involves, um, how, how, how we do it, what we're looking for, um, and, um, and how we make it fun and interactive rather than kind of num number crunching and audience figures counting. So um, one thing we thought we might do, <clears throat> and we'd love to open this out to discussion uh, quite shortly, what we thought we might do is um, think about last night. I imagine many of you were present last night at Linguamania um, as a way of both celebrating language um, and uh, performing creative multilingualism, but also um, getting a sense of what the wider public, who we're trying to appeal to with impact, of course, um, how, how they respond to, to the project. Um, it's the case, of course, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we thought that this would be a useful session to have. Um, it's the case, of course, that creative multilingualism assumes impact, right? It, it, it assumes that out of multilingualism, there's a creative spark that creates something new, something, something interesting and, and possibly resonant and significant for people. Uh, so the conundrum is, how do we gauge that? Where do we, where, where do we pick that up? Um, and uh, certainly, from my own point of view, subjective point of view, um, this business of birds, uh, both last night in the, in the bite-sized talks and now in the previous session, it's clear that that is something that uh, really, really uh, calls to people tweets out to them and, and um, elicits their enthusiasm. Um, but the, the, that's speaking with my enthusiastic side, speaking with my um, ref impact assessor hat on, the, <laughs> the puzzle is how to, how to capture that over the long term, how to assess, how to measure that. So that's what we're here to, to, to think aloud about. And um, I'd now just like to hand over to my... Um, fellow panelists to, to give their sort of comments, observations in brief, and then we can have a, a bit of discussion about that. Um, the, I suppose the key words always are reach and significance, right? It's quite easy, actually, um, to demonstrate reach, to, uh, you know, um, count audience numbers or numbers of hits on websites. But it's the thing about lasting change to people's thinking that is, that, that's the tricky one. Okay, so, um, so I'd like to hand over to, to Katrin Cole to, uh, to talk about linguamania and evaluating impact. <laughs> Thank you, so just to say, we have a, um, a creative multilingualism project, which is a program, which is um, AHRC funded, and beyond that, also um, a creative multilingualism network, which is embedded in TORCH in the um, Humanities Research Centre, which Elika runs, um, which is much more open and, and, and able to involve um, people who are interested in the work we do. So that, that will be, we'll be um, offering papers over and, and, and discussion forums over the, last, over the next four years. On the question of impact, um, that's, a, that's something that I've had to engage with very closely at, um, and, and the research team as a whole um, in preparing um, our application for this project. It was, um, it was intended to have 
Um, that was the, in, in the call, and we weren't given much guidance beyond that, a transformational impact on modern languages research in the UK. Um, and what was very clear straight away is that if we were talking about a transformational impact on research in the UK, we needed to also think about schools, um, because without the feed-through of young people coming from schools and with an enthusiastic to take up languages, actually our modern languages departments are dying. Um, and in the work with that, where I'd, I'd also done quite a bit of work with German with schools, um, there was huge potential in schools, a huge amount of excellent teaching going on, very enthusiastic teaching, huge initiative, hugely creative initiatives in schools that sometimes we don't see from the university end because part, partly we're looking at the um, impact of things like severe grading, which actually cripples teachers' lives, cripples kids' ability to enjoy the language, um, where actually grading problems lead to modern languages um, results being poorer than in other subjects. It's more difficult to get a good, good grade in modern languages and so on. Syllabus constraints, um, government um, league tables and so on. Lots of problems like that that one is contending with all the time when it comes to recruitment. But once you work with the schools themselves and actually see what, um, what creative um, projects are going on there, um, it's, it's hugely encouraging. And I think one of the... Um, encouraging aspects I found yesterday about Linguamania was how many young people attended and what a huge um, sense there was of participating and of being enthusiastic. And I think um, anybody who was there will have, will have, will have seen that. And um, a reception prior to that um, was also, I think, it opened up a whole other aspect of what we've become very aware of in the project, which is the huge importance of um, what we might call community languages, of all the languages that are actually being spoken in the UK all the time, that are in the homes, that are being in the communities, in groups. And um, I, I've begun to speculate whether perhaps the UK really might be perhaps the most multilingual country in the world, certainly one of them, and that we really have very little idea of how that works, what languages are being spoken, how much, where, and so on. Even in Oxford, um, we've been doing some excellent work with um, the Oxford um, uh, Spires Acad Academy, and, uh, and then that's a, a, with a strand led by Matthew. And uh, it's clear there that a school is embracing that multilingualism, bringing in poet, well, appointing a writer in residence who's working with the children, enabling them to use all the different languages they speak at home, bringing in, for instance, an Arabic poet running workshops. This is something that we can learn from, and that means that really then an impact becomes something that is very much two-way, very much collaborative, and where we have as much to learn from um, the communities which we are working with as we have to give to them. And I think that's something that, for me, um, has actually opened up hugely new possibilities in research. Um, when it then comes to evaluating that, um, the, the challenge that we face particularly as a project that claims to be in some way embracing creativity, encouraging um, creativity, is that if you're going to measure transformational impact, the obvious way to do it is to give people a questionnaire before an event, they have to fill it in, you then give them the same questionnaire afterwards and see whether something has changed. I've always found that as about as much of a turn-off as anything could be. And <laughs> it, 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 it runs completely counter to what any positive experience might be that I've taken away from the event. So in looking at what we could do with linguamania in terms of getting some kind of valuable data that we could then present to the AHRC and say, hey, look, this has had a transformational impact, um, we had to think a bit about how we might begin to um, fate, begin to deal with that challenge and we'll be coming up with hope and we hope ideas along the way and we're very much talking to other parts of the university to see what ideas might be there. So just looking very briefly at um, the issues that we need to then deal with, first who are our, who's, what is our target audience? Actually quite hard to define. So in a way really we want that age 14 to 17 or perhaps even younger because they are the ones who are going to be taking up languages, we hope, and wanting to learn languages. On the other hand, Lingua Mania was um, an event um, very much constructed, designed collaboratively with the Ashmolean within the framework of Live Fridays. 
Live Fridays, their target audience is 18 to 35. So we thought, well, it would be foolish, really, to try and make this into a family event and lose that audience that Live Fridays appeal to. Let's run with that audience of 18 to 35-year-olds because, actually, they're hugely important. They allow us to generate lots of material and understanding of what makes language cool. What, you know, what, why is it cool to speak lots of languages? What can you do with that? And then have material that might appeal to the younger age group and perhaps draw them in as well, although we did also um, have various mechanisms for trying to appeal to 14 to 17-year-olds. So then the general public as opinion leaders and mediators, often parents, for example. The 14 to 17-year-olds, year, year um, Oxford Bus Company allowed us to um, give free bus tickets, so that was one way of appealing um, to them, and we went through schools for that. So what we realised there is we should have really started much earlier, starting perhaps a year before, um, setting up all the mechanisms and then being able to have a real marketing drive. So that's something we, we, we've learnt from. Research participants and enthusiasts beyond modern languages. This is supposed to be an interdisciplinary um, research project. So um, Lingua Mania became a community building um, exercise and actually, again, was very exciting to see um, who responded to our call um, to, um, to, 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 to be involved. And that will then build um, a basis for future um, ventures. The objectives of Lingua Mania to enhance audience appreciation that languages are connected with creativity, enjoyable, personally enriching. So the, the, the whole personal angle. And in the reception um, yesterday, um, we had um, the, the, the Lord Mayor of Oxford um, kindly agreed to um, say a few words. And I simply said, perhaps if he wouldn't mind saying a few words about why languages were um, personally of interest to him, and, and, uh, he, because he has a, a background that I, I could see from the website, there was some Urdu and Hindi in there. He talked very engagingly about the importance of languages for him. And it wasn't just Urdu and Hindi. There were three other languages in there as well. There were other ways of engaging with, with, with communities that went back into, right into his history and his very personal history. And that's one of the things I've become aware of, that really um, la it's, it's language, language lives, as we call them, the sort of living languages, the, the, the biographies that are individually different. And he... Um, gave that expression in a poem that he'd brought along for us, an Urdu, which he gave to us in Urdu and in English, and he was translating there for us. And so, and there you had a sense that actually here was somebody who we really needed to talk to. We needed to talk to the people he knows. We would find out so much more about the community that our institution is embedded in. Extending into interdis the interdisciplinary reach of multilingual, creative multilingualism within the research community, and you are very much part of that. This is, again, something that we need to be working on. The evaluation objectives, what worked well and did not work well with respect to the objectives, that's something we will be analysing over the, the coming months. Changing attitudes towards languages with respect to those objectives. Engaging a broader circle of researchers and the public in our programme. And not least, what worked well and didn't work well with respect to organisations. So there are various things that we'll be looking at there. And of course, it becomes then a very rich source of data, not least the kind of feedback we got um, and also the personal conversations and what we realised worked and didn't work well. So the evaluation tools we used, a pre-event survey sent by the Ashmolean, but designed with input from us. So we will be looking partly at what, what are the responses of that, but also what kind of responses did what question generate? Was it effective? Um, during the events, we came up with the idea of having postcards for free comment um, with large, sorry, this is about the typo there, receptacles and pencils distributed in the galleries and the, at the exit. Um, we had a survey for the bite-sized talks, volunteer survey interviews, box pops, and a little exit poll where um, people were given Scrabble, Scrabble um, tiles to put in one of the bins. And that was actually rather successful, partly because you were sort of seeing how people were coming out. Um, occasionally, you'd get somebody who didn't want to um, put in their Scrabble tile, but most of them were actually, oh, right, OK, oh, yeah, that's nice. Um, and so that was uh, then also, uh, that, that's been a very useful way of, of, of seeing what the response was. I'm pleased to say that almost all of them, in fact, went into the smiley face one. And then a post-event survey, which will be sent out, <clears throat> and where we then may also follow up in individual terms. 
So that's my take on this. Thank you, Catherine. Rebecca, would you like to respond with any observations? Sure. So <laughs> I'm very aware that 95% of the audience are probably thinking, who's this person and why is she on the stage? So <laughs> I'll just briefly explain what I think I'm bringing to, to the discussion. Um, so Catherine very kindly invited me to be on the advisory board for the project. So one of the uh, more formal tasks I'll have is precisely to see how it's fulfilling its targets and meeting the, this, um, this, this requirement to have impact. Um, I also have run projects, so RC UK funded projects myself in 2014 to 16. I had a leadership fellowship from the HRC. Um, and I mention that because it impresses upon me the iterative nature of impact. So, you know, you have to set out when you're applying for any RC UK funding how you intend to have impact. And then there's a, a tool uh, uh, called Research Fish that you have to fill in every year for a few years after your project has finished. And the process of going through that process has made me understand, or think differently, I think, about what having impact might mean and how you might evaluate it. Um, and the other thing that I do is I'm also Associate Director for the Institute for Social Futures in Lancaster, um, which is a, an interdisciplinary research centre, um, which is very much predicated on the idea that you bring together different kinds of academic research with policy makers and practitioners, and that all of the thinking that we're sort of facilitating should have a direct use um, in society. Um, so... Two things, I guess, I'm, I'm bringing from that and thinking in response to, to what Catherine was saying. The first is really to stress the idea that impact is a process. And, you know, if you have one event and then you want to go, oh, what was the impact? It's kind of like, you know, I'll chuck an event at you and let's see what the impact is. Um, and it's, it's really very difficult to get m much beyond the numbers of Scrabble tiles in the happy face um, and the surveys that kind of tick, yes, we liked us, uh, in some form or other. Uh, so the, the, the one snapshot, you, when you're filling in research fish, you need this. Um, and then, you know, it, it's actually really quite a blunt tool, the, the, the way you can record impact in that, that the figures are useful and you can, um, you know, that is kind of what they're, they're looking for. But it's the most boring end of impact. Uh, a much more interesting way of doing impact, I think, is to ask not what you can do for impact, but what impact can do for you. And this is how I've started thinking in this impact, in this iterative process of thinking about how the projects I've been developing are allowing me to interact with different partners. So building on the leadership fellowship that I had, um, I've been involved with the Literary Centre in London. And it became apparent that they were under pressure to prove the impact of their events. Um, well, I say under pressure, but they didn't have this negative sense of we've got to tick the boxes. They said, well, we put on all of these events. It's really difficult to judge where people go with it. You know, we know the events are successful and people keep coming back, but there's so much more that goes on, but we can't, we can't get it, so we can't quantify it. Um, and we ended up collaborating with them on an evaluation of the impact of their work. And it was interesting for us because they, were, they, they ran a whole series of events around International Translation Day. And the, the project that, that I've been running is Authors in the World, so it's about how literature gets out there and, um, and has some social significance. And from our point of view as researchers, we wanted to know how people talk about translation. And that was, that was actually part of our research programme, how is translation spoken about and we, so we, we agreed with them that they would run their event and we would then have a focus group after the event where we got people to reflect on what had happened in the opening plenary for that day. So the, the, the literary centre got out of it that we then ran a, a one and a half hour discussion with select members of the audience about what had really come out of it for them. Um, and we did a kind of a linguistic analysis of it. So a colleague of mine in linguistics did a, a discourse analysis of how people spoke about the event, um, what kinds of things kept recurring, and how did that map onto the surveys? Because, of course, there were also the post-event surveys. Um, and it meant that we were able to really go into some detail on the one-liners that people write 
on forms and see what people might really have meant by that and what further issues might be coming out of that, that kind of an event so that when that centre runs, you know, International Translation Day comes around every year, when they run it next year, what might they like to pick up on because that was where people were really, that was where conversation really took off in our focus group and what things might they like to soft pedal on, for example. But for us as researchers, it gave us fantastic data um, to then think about, well, how do people talk about translation? Because we had wonderful variety of, um, of, of members of the public in our focus group. So that's one way of thinking, I think, about how impact... It's not just a case of do your academic stuff, chuck it at the public, and then hope that you can somehow capture that it's changed their lives, but really bring the public into... Or when I say the public, I mean you know, any, anybody beyond academe. Bring them into the kind of research you're doing, because what we have now with the Literary Centre is a really interesting partnership where we're constantly in conversation with one another about how their practice might improve and about how our research might kind of directions our research might take in response to the needs that are out there. And I'll finish in a minute. The other, only other thing I wanted to say was to go back to the, why I mentioned the Institute for Social Futures, was the importance of interdisciplinarity for what we were doing, because I kind of blithely said when I was in an early talk to the Literary Centre, oh yeah, we can help you run your evaluation of your day. And I went back to my university and I went, help! <laughs> what have I promised? I'm only a lecturer in German. But because, uh, because I have you know, colleagues in linguistics and social sciences who routinely do these sorts of things, we were able to think about how do you take something that's coming from the literary world, and I would imagine most people in this world don't feel very comfortable, in this world, in this room, don't feel very comfortable in trying to sort of do run focus groups in that sort of a more sociological sense that, you know, that, the, that interdisciplinary collaboration, I think, is also key to really using impact in a, in a useful way. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, both to Rebecca Braun and Catherine Cole. Um, I'm feeling, I may be sort of projecting this, I'm feeling that the room is, has a sense of, um, you know, what impact, why, uh, you know, um, after all the, you know, the wonders of, 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 of language and birdsong. Um, so, so if that's the case, um, do, do speak up in the, in, in, in the, in the discussion. If it's not, it um, would be really interesting to hear from people how they are enthused by impact. But before we open out, I just, just did want to pick up, um, as, you know, between ourselves, um, this, this focus on education that you, that you mentioned um, as part of your presentation, Katrin, um, and, and whether um, it is, and thinking of policy and impact on policy, um, educational policy, whether there are ways of really embedding that... Um, that discussion with the teachers about how to make languages more interesting in the syllabus, in the, in the, the, the languages syllabus that's delivered to schools. I say this partly with self-interest in mind because um, one of my sons is, doing, is, is writing his GCSEs at the moment and he's taking French and German. And truly, there is nothing more dire than the format of the GCSE exam script. You know, it's all boxes and ticks and crosses and there's no creativity in it whatsoever. So I was I was wondering whether you might have any thoughts on how this you know this 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 interactive aspect that you too were talking about Rebecca in respect of your um, Lancaster project what how how that might um, involve teachers and the teaching community and the examination community. Can I perhaps say something about that because mm. I've been involved in a number of. Um, Modern languages um, ventures recently in, in in terms of policy making and um, the exam syllabuses. So I was on an um, A level content advisory board where um, the, there are now new there is now a new GCSE syllabus and a new um, A level syllabus that is being taught um, where things have shifted ever so slightly, um, opening it up to things which have for a while had been in a sense, driven out of the syllabus, one being literature, one being la um, translation, um, also film, which then also, to some extent, brings in theatre and so on. So there's, there's, a, there's a bit of an opening up, which actually has then also revealed that th there has been a loss of expertise in these areas, that because teachers haven't been teaching these things, they haven't been valued, therefore now there's a tremendous lack of confidence in how one might teach it. And above all else, how is it, how is it then assessed? Because often the assessment... Um, the, the people who are assessing it 
um, aren't really appreciating um, the kind of work that's being done and don't, again, have the, have the tools to assess what is good work and what isn't because it's the box ticking mm -hmm. approach. And I think we're really only very much at the beginning of that, but that now is the time where we need to develop that dialogue and build up relationships, which mean that over the long term, we can hopefully build up also a more joined up conversation between schools and universities where the syllabuses have just diverged radically and where universities actually probably also haven't been doing enough in terms of um, practicing practical skills in ways that are creative and also do it, um, drawing to some extent some, sometimes on expertise in schools. So I think it's a, a dialogue and where again the impact, um, perhaps the, the impact ambition is actually potentially a very positive one. Rebecca, did, did you have any thoughts about um, outreach to, to schools through your project in, in, in London, for example, in Literary London? Um, I don't have any very specific yeah. comments to make. I mean, mm. I was just thinking as you were speaking, Catherine, am I right in thinking one of the, where, one of the places where the reform of the A-level syllabus kind of fell down is that they didn't really involve teachers? <laughs> yes. So the, um, the, um, after after a, a, a very long period where universities have increasingly been driven out of the exam process, um, Michael Gove then decided that he wanted universities to be um, back involved in, uh, in designing exams, and uh, they then created panels which consisted entirely of university teachers who had no direct experience of teaching in schools a lot of the time or, um, or of the examining process. So... Um, that, that was a very obvious mistake mm. um, that by the time that became obvious it was already too late to do anything about it and there wasn't much of a will from government to do it differently and um, it was then also rushed through without proper consultation with teachers and then of course you end up with a them and us yeah. um, mentality which is very understandable because actually it was designed as a them and us <laughs> Yeah. Um, process. So I suppose so that's the, so, sorry. That, that's kind of what, where I was going to really is that it's an example of how important developing relationships are mm -hmm. for impact. And um, we heard earlier on today that learning a language takes at least four years. That it's a, it's a long process, and it's really the same with impact. And you have to have all of the people who you want to have impact on and with um, need to be involved uh, throughout the process. Interesting point to open up. Yes, and I already see a couple of hands. So, observations, tips on impact, please. Direct engagement with language from the earlier sessions, and then and this one, and your anxiety, Elika. The language of impact is significant. I mean, in even in the propositions that you toyed with right there. I mean, the, the difference between talking about having impact with someone versus trying to raise grant funding with the wrong idea about what impact is and how you have it on someone, that can make all the difference in, an, in, an, in the success of an application. Now, I wonder if any of you could just quickly comment on what it is you did in your applications uh, for this program that so, it captured in your language the, the right spirit uh, so that this was judged to be worthy of such support. Uh, how did you represent the kind of impact you'd be having with the kinds of partners you're, you're working with? That's a great question. I'm just going to gather a couple of questions. So um, that was a, that's sort of observation and a tip um, requested. Yes, please. Oh, lots of, lots of hands. Um, good afternoon, my name is Robert Lawson. I'm a senior lecturer in sociolinguistics at uh, Birmingham City University. Um, and this is something that I've been thinking about an awful lot um, in, in the last couple of years, the, the role of, of language research beyond academia and, and the, the uh, contribution that it can make to sort of public life, and particularly its, its role in, in terms of improving human well-being. Um, and one of the things that, that, that strikes me um, is that an awful lot of lessons can be taken from research in sociolinguistics. I'm thinking particularly of uh, people like um, William LeBov, Walt Wolfram, John Rickford, who have uh, spent you know, a, a large part of their career um, bringing together language research into the community. William LeBov talks about the, uh, the uh, debt 
to the community that, that we offer, you know, the, the, uh, the linguists have, because that's where we get our data from and, and the, the importance of us trying to contribute back to that. Um, so I suppose my general kind of point is that when we take the impact agenda, we're looking at it from a kind of very sort of governmentally driven perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the work that I've uh, been doing over the last couple of years is trying to bring together um, more local and, and community based understandings of, of impact. And it's good to see sort of moves in that way, but a lot of what seems to be happening at the moment, and obviously the, the project is at a very early stage, but what seems to be kind of the, the driving force is a lot of uh, public engagement and, and, and dissemination, which I think is you know, a really important part of it. Um, but I think, you know, in, in terms of sort of tips moving, moving forward, you know, what kinds of changes can this research have to these local communities? And that's something, you know, uh, as I say, that, that what, you know, people like Walt Will from uh, and so on have talked an awful lot about in terms of the changes that, 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 that their work has brought to the, the community. So I, I would just wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about what the kinds of directions that you envision in terms of how this... Uh, research program will actually, fun, you know, make fundamental changes to, to, to people's lives, not just in terms of kind of improving their linguistic awareness and, and, and their sense of sort of self-confidence about their linguistic diversity, but, you know, more, more fundamentally in that, you know, do you have any ideas of actually what will, what will, what will change? Thank you, thank you. And one more, um, back of, yes. Uh, my name is Zainab El Khatib. Uh, as I mentioned before, I teach French and Spanish. Uh, middle school. I actually, before that, I used to uh, implement primary languages through uh, Edge, Hill, Edge Hill University because I'm very keen in children learning language earlier at a natural way of life. Uh, I've just picked up from your conversations uh, a very valuable point regarding the GCSE, for example. In, in personal experience, my daughter doing her GCSE in French I encouraged her to do it in French, but as Catherine just mentioned, it became like a box ticking to the extent that it put her completely off taking it further for A level, which it makes me feel like I more of a damaged it. I'm not the teacher, but due to the, the pressure on teachers, it's a matter of box ticking rather than we're learning language, we want to enjoy it, we want creativity. It is not only a, a box ticking, it's beyond the classroom. Um, I was wondering if it's maybe in future or you can include it in your project, if it's going to be like building relationship or bridges between yourselves and schools where teachers and yourselves work together to improve language teaching methodology. Because I believe it's the methodology that makes the children interesting in any language. I mean, obviously, because I teach French and Spanish, I relate to those two languages. But actually, if, if the methodology is correct, the children will have that love and enjoyable enjoyment for any language in future. As I've heard as well from some of the speakers, that one language switch you on to another language and so on. M maybe something you will consider to have that kind of small projects in the school or a relationship between yourselves and the schools so we work together to achieve our aim thank you thank, thank you so much to uh to all three uh questioners uh we had a question about tips really that we had a question about sociolinguistics and a more embedded engagement with the community and we had a question about teaching yeah. rebecca katrin is, is there any of aspect you'd like to pick up on? I, well, I could pick up immediately. It was just something that, that occurred to me as the last speaker was um, speaking. Um, th that one of the difficulties that I've observed in, in other projects that have been trying to set up um, relationships with schools is how little time there is in the curriculum for any kind of innovation, short of the curriculum itself being innovated, which is, would be a huge undertaking. Um, it can be quite difficult for, for teachers to start making, just literally making the space to do things differently. 
And um, a suggestion was made last week by somebody in educational research in... Um, there's a really odd echo on my microphone, but anyway, <laughs> that are hearing myself as I speak. Um, so this person in educational research was addressing just this, this issue on, on another project, and uh, the suggestion was that after-school clubs are a hugely under... Um, utilised resource that while the curriculum itself and what happens in the classroom it's maybe rather difficult to make significant changes there anytime soon. Um, you do have after school clubs many of which are actually looking for some kinds of activities that they can do with the kids and it seems that this could be um, a way of building partnerships because that is so important to build partnerships but build partnerships where your partners can really start to see benefits quite quickly and you know there's a much more open creative space when you get out of the official classroom and you know get the kids some other way. Perhaps building on that I mean one thing we've we have built into in fact into our um, research program um, will be um, setting up or, or encouraging um, um, after school or in school clubs mm. um, which might also involve parents for instance or other other um, people in the community who could have um, something to offer and, and one of the aspects that I think could potentially trans help to transform the way um, modern languages is seen in the UK and out also, in a sense, practised as a, as a school subject um, is to make much, much more of the community languages and of, of the expertise in languages that is in ev every school amongst the children but also amongst the broader community that's involved with the school, so the parents um, and, and, and people who might be interested in being um, involved in other ways. And I, I think that could really open up the way in which languages are seen as being part of people's lives rather than just a very boring subject um, that is taught in ways that are often, in a sense, prescribed to be boring because of the way they're being tested. Um, and I think that is the, the huge challenge. And I think that's where we could work together and where we could then begin to also make a difference to methodology. There is, I think one of the things that I've seen in um, terms of methodology is that um, increasingly the um, approach has gone towards practical skills, um, which has often pushed out the content, the literary content, the cultural content, um, any interest in um, what what makes people tick in relation to languages and in, in relation to different cultures, because it's not assessed. It's not formally assessed. All that's assessed is the skills, and therefore it becomes then completely irrelevant what you write about. Well, if you communicate to your kids, it really, frankly, doesn't matter what you write. It doesn't even really matter whether you've seen that <coughs> film and can really write about it properly, because the examiners don't need to have seen that film. Um, that it's going to kill off any subject. And I think it's that cultural richness that we need to bring back in um, and I think um, school clubs could be a way of doing it, events could be a way of doing it, the kind of workshops that Oxford Spires Academy does, um, which is about poetry, and it's about, and my student, a couple of my students were part of the, um, the workshop that was run, one of the first workshop in, in the series um, that Matthew's um, working on, and uh, the students were, were really, I think, the they, they were extraordinarily enthusiastic and really also very moved by the way in which the children were, were drawing on their life experiences, often very, very difficult and painful experiences of, um, as refugees and of, 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 of homelands left behind and so on. But it was bringing languages alive in a, in a way that hadn't been done before. And I think, um, just to come back to um, Pegram's point about what tips, um, well... Certainly, we spent a year and a half trying to work out what what was meant what what was meant by the call. What was it really looking for? How do we do transformation? How do we um, engage with the question of impact? Um, I think one of the things that I found promising and and and, and was grateful for was that the AHRC doesn't see it as narrow, narrowly as the REF um, program, but it was it, we had to define pathways to impact. Well. Pathways to impact is a much nicer way of thinking about it than um, that sort of very kind of um, sort of product-oriented approach. And, uh, and I think it was thinking in terms of it as being a genuine collaboration. That was, that was the challenge, to actually co-design co co our projects with our partners. And we've got 16 partners, and we were working with those, and we got a certain way, and, but it's 
it's work in progress, and that is what it's meant to be. I'm not sure whether I've answered all the Spot on. <laughs> Thank, thanks so much, Catherine and, and Rebecca. I think we have time for maybe just another uh, clutch of questions. The person by the pillar, Charles in the back, and birds. <laughs> Um, thank you. I, I, will, I will be quick. Um, I, I just want to say I teach uh, French and Spanish in, um, in the curriculum and, and also in after-school clubs in primary schools. And I've noticed um, a competition with after-school club activities. For example, um, um, sometimes children um, would rather do a sports activity or, or a music activity. And I'm... Uh, would it be possible for you to liaise um, with some uh, multilingual celebrities to try and make languages more popular um, with with wider public, not just bilingual families? Uh, for example, um, I read, uh, that was a couple of years ago, that Arsene Wenger, uh, who is a m multilingual um, football coach, went into schools and that was uh, uh, very successful, apparently. Uh, um, for instance, Arsenal have a very successful program called Double Club. They work together with the Goethe Institute and with other institutes, and they've, they've, they've done a lot of very good work. And certainly, yes, I think you're absolutely right. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Charles Fosdick from University of Liverpool. Um, just to go back to the first question about the whole vocabulary and, and language of impact, and I, I say this as somebody who, like Elika, has been complicit in the assessment of, as others in the room as well, I assume, in, in the uh, assessment of impact. I think as modern linguists, w we've got a, a real potential contribution to those debates about how we actually talk about these processes. I've made the case to uh, the HRC and to Hefke on numerous occasions without yielding any real response, because I think it's too late, that impact is wholly inappropriate um, as, as a metaphor. It's crude, it's violent, it suggests a single event. Um, translation is actually much more helpful um, to understand the sorts of processes we're talking about. Um, translation allows us to move away from the single vector of impact, and it allows us to think about, picking up on what Katrine said, um, th th that the types of activity you're engaged in are two-way streets. Um, and th they're actually about l modern languages learning a great deal from the multilingual communities of the UK in ways we haven't in the past. And that leads us into the crucial area of um, the co-creation of research, um, w w which I know is part of the project. So I think on the one hand, impact is this technical, uh, formal requirement. What's much more important, I think, and what you demonstrated last night was the challenge of nurturing a, a public understanding of language, um, or more sort of Mary Louise Pratt several years ago in the state talked, States talked about a public idea um, about language, and that's where we've got a real deficit, and that's where I see, re see real opportunities with your project and, and the other three hourly projects. And um, over this side. Sorry, the, yeah, the bird, the bird corner. Okay. Um, <laughs> actually, I was going to, I, I work, although I was on the stage and I work for BirdLife International, I'm also seconded two days a week to work for something called the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, which is part of the university, and which rather like the Institute of Social Futures at Lancaster is an attempt to bring together um, researchers, policymakers, and practitioners. And I was quite interested just to ask a bit more, maybe the panel to reflect on this issue of interdisciplinarity. So I think interdisciplinarity is often thought of in terms of interdiscipline, not naturally enough. But I think there's something very powerful too about this combination, particularly of research and practice. Certainly in the conservation community, that's been a major challenge, bringing people together who do research and to, who do conservation practice. The other point I'd make is that a major challenge for us is also working at scale. So a lot of us work very locally, very much with local communities, but many of the debates take place at national, regional, and global level. And I think that that issue of scale, trying to understand what language can contribute to a better understanding of scale, would be very valuable in terms of thinking how we're dealing with our impact. I also just wanted to hand the microphone to you guys. If that's all right, um, just, I'm, this is following up from a couple perspectives. One is what I saw last night at Linguamania. 
and then something I'm experiencing at my own university. But I'm curious to what degree we're using, um, well, wonderfully, we're using creative multilingualism website as a resource, but also as a resource to carry on conversations that are started in these different events. Um, and one thing we observed with the game we were playing is that it inspired a lot of creative thinking. And, and I have a collection of words given to us across languages of, are these bird words? And I would love to be able to direct that population. And I tried, I said, we maybe be able to put that up on the website so you can come back and see as we explore your words, are they bird words? And can we use, can we use the creative multilingualism website or other aspects of technology um, as something both to continue the conversations we start in these events. Um, I'd also love to use it as a resource for bibliographies. I had somebody come up after the, the, the short little talk and ask about where can I, I get more on this, and I would love to give them a reading list. And so to use the website as some place to direct individuals, as some place to continue, we're going to design um, a, um, a, a, a community interactive game later. Um, and also, how it's coming to us in the university is we're being turned into numbers. Um, so they start measuring my worth as to how many times people click on the articles I publish. And so um, they have to be clickable. Um, but if we have to go into this awful world of turning um, the, the conversations we start into something that's measurable, is the website a way to, to, to do that, seeing how much we can bring people to engage with an interactive resource? Thank you so much. Um, web websites are actually extraordinarily useful and blogs and and, and kind of crowds, crowdsourcing responses to particular questions, your bird word questions, for example. And perhaps um, also, I mean, I think one of the um, things that uh, we're learning to think about how, how, to, how to use more effectively, and I think, again, where schools could be involved in, and, and communities is, is making use of social media, which, which is, is a much more process-oriented medium than a website. So I think that's um, something where, again, um, we, we, we can be doing a lot more work together. Mm. Rebecca, did you want to respond yeah. at all? Yeah, well, so specifically mm. to the, the, the point about interdisciplinarity, thank you for, uh, for just unpicking the term a little and, and pointing to the relationship between um, academ academes and, and external partners. And I think, actually, one of the key things to, to, to focus on is confidence, because um, you know, when, when the Institute for Social Futures launched, it had a kind of a, a, a soft launch in London in uh, ooh, 2015, September 2015, and it was in a room with, you know, they had people, from, they had politicians, they had um, SMEs, they had people who work in the Ministry of Defence, they had all, a whole swathe of people, and I was kind of sitting there thinking... No one's really going to want to know about literature. And, but, you know, in the conversations that I had, I was really amazed at how straight away uh, people were going, oh, yeah, you know, literature, that's so important, and that's a really way, you know, you, you can really imagine your new worlds. And they were sort of, they, they were doing my sales pitch for me. And it just made me think how kind of beaten down you get in the university context where you kind of think, well, the general public won't really want to know about what we do, and, you know, my goodness, the other half of campus doesn't even really want to know about what we do. And I just thought, well, actually, they do. And, you know, lots of people are really, really interested in the kind of stuff that we were hearing this morning. So being more confident about how you approach those partnerships is key to making them successful. That's a wonderful, positive note on which to uh, draw this uh, morning session to a close. Um, I'm sure you're all um, dying for sandwiches, and I saw them uh, in, in the adjacent room. But before we break um, up to go and do that, could we thank Rebecca Braun, um, Lancaster University, Catherine Cole here at Oxford, uh, and all of you um, for actually a really interesting and exploratory discussion about the dread impact. Translation. Thank you, Charles. <laughs>